Welcome everyone to our next master lecture in the GoFly Master Lecture Series. It's my pleasure to welcome you all uh, today with our uh, master, uh, Joe Nickerson. Um, as you all know, Boeing is the grand sponsor of GoFly, and we are joined by corporate sponsor Pratt and Whitney, as well as over 20 aerospace and STEM organizations around the world. Um, today, Joe Nickerson uh, will be lecturing about designing for stability and control with novel aircraft configurations. He is a flying qualities manager and associate technical fellow at Boeing Vertical Lift in Philadelphia with experience in handling qualities, wind tunnel testing, and aeronautical engineering. Joe attended the University of Notre Dame and RPI. He has worked on a number of rotorcraft, including the V-22 Osprey, um, tilt rotor, and the Comanche and Chinook helicopters. It's my pleasure to introduce Joe Nickerson. Good morning. Thank you, Nidhi. Let me share my screen with you. And uh, we'll start. So I'm joined also uh, by Bruce Kothman um, from U University of Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, he's also given one of the previous uh, lectures. So uh, uh, very helpful to have him on board. So the subtitle of this is, Are You Handling This? Designing for Stability and Control with Novel Aircraft Configurations. And I will start with a novel aircraft configuration, a little bit about me. Um, I got to take this photograph and uh, use it in a technical paper. It's about uh, conducting uh, mission task elements uh, testing uh, in natural winds. And I'll go into some more about mission task elements, uh, but I wanted to just bring this in here to show how much fun I get to have uh, as an engineer. So I wanted to show a little bit about the, the GoFly uh, phase one winners. Um, the only um, knowledge I really have of these configurations is the pictures uh, that we're showing here and this page and the following one. But I noticed that a lot of them uh, fall into sort of uh, some common groupings, uh, whether they're, um, uh, have two or three uh, uh, sets of rotors, or uh, whether they're uh, uh, more oriented towards, uh, say, ducted fans, uh, or if they uh, have uh, look like the stand-on platforms, uh, helicopter-type platforms, or whether they, uh, well, I'm not sure how to describe all of them yet. So uh, the bottom line is I'm going to, I'm going to, I made some observations about these. Uh, configurations, uh, as well as learned about some others from the internet, and uh, just thought I'd uh, bring these up and uh, uh, walk us through some of the, the common uh, experiences and pitfalls uh, leading towards uh, stability and control. So uh, often demonstrations occur indoors, so when you're testing a vehicle, you got to watch out for um, uh, crosswinds that are occurring um, due to the environment and the recirculation that you might get inside of a building that you may or may not experience outside. Uh, so a lot of these uh, just have references to videos. I'm not going to play videos uh, for you, but you can look them up online. Um, it's one thing to talk about an open rotor where there are many known aerodynamic challenges uh, for a single, uh, both for multiple open rotors and for single ducted rotors, but a combination of multiple uh, ducted rotors uh, is something uh, uh, that really is a novel configuration and it may have interesting uh, interactions uh, to, that, that are different from when you go from initial tests to, to more of a production oriented uh, case. Um, an autonomous vehicle uh, perhaps uh, with a pilot or, or perhaps not and um, uh, multiple configurations, uh, open rotors, and the bottom line is uh, discovering that you have inadequate control uh, can be pretty risky uh, uh, to the individual. And, and uh, that's gonna be our jumping off point for what the motivation was for this, uh, for this talk. The GoFly Master Lectures have been great on focusing on aerodynamics and flight mechanics of helicopters. Uh, but the first thing to notice about the GoFly winning vehicles is uh, they're not all traditional helicopters. And so the question is, what guidance can we give to these novel configurations to assume that they are, uh, to ensure that they're stable and in control? 
So some character, without dwelling too much on helicopters, but I'm gonna constantly refer back to them. They seem to be a reasonably su successful configuration. Um, the helicopter control is mostly independent of 1G lift. Um, and uh, they have inherent damping due to flapping, whether uh, either locally due to flapping or due to displaced rotors at large moment arms. There is significant cross coupling between axes and uh, they often have quite different inertias between each axis. And I'll go into this, some of these in a little more detail here. So control of a single rotor helicopter um, falls into a couple of categories. Use power with collective pitch or um, uh, to generate vertical thrust. There's cross coupling due to that change of torque uh, that requires uh, the tail rotor to uh, offset that torque in this particular configuration of, of um, helicopter. Um, in both lateral and uh, longitudinal control, cyclic is used to tilt the thrust vector or to generate moments about the hub. Uh, the, the important feature here is that while the control power for each of the rotors may be, uh, or for each axis may be the same due to the rotor, uh, the inertia can be quite different. And um, to, to, to the order of even uh, 10 to one difference uh, between axes, um, that uh, makes it really important to understand in your configurations, uh, the, the asymmetries or the lack of, uh, of, of of symmetry around the aircraft and what that means to the harmony uh, or, or the controllability by the pilot. So I've shown you a configuration that's sort of the typical helicopter where, or the modern helicopter, where all the control is uh, done through, uh, say, a, a main rotor and with cyclic and collective pitch and a tail rotor, but that wasn't always the way. Um, so, uh, you know, look for look for opportunities, uh, uh, even to go back into the past um, in finding uh, better ways to generate the moments that you need to roll the aircraft, point the thrust vector in the direction that you want, or to coordinate your turns uh, in forward flight. Uh, and again, I, I, I just skipped this one, uh, you know, looking for radical differences uh, in geometry, inertia, or control power uh, between your different axes in terms of the sizing of the, of the vehicle. So I included this chart as a way of saying that while again the inertia is in the, both the pitch axis and the yaw axis of a typical helicopter, what this does for you is it gives you some sense of how to size, uh, how much control is adequate. Um, have both a trim case here in terms of offsetting the torque of the main rotor, but also the uh, maximum capability of how much uh, thrust the tail rotor can generate gives you a sense of how much yaw control and acceleration that you can, you can generate. Right. So what about the GoFly phase one mooning vehicles? They're mostly not traditional helicopters. So what can we say about those? Well, from the pictures, it looks like that the moment control and lift are strongly coupled. And I'll go into each of these in more detail, and I'll probably just uh, skip forward to those. But the, the, the biggest thing here is that the short moment arms between the control devices often uh, very uh, tightly coupled in terms of spatial uh, dimensions um, and what that does to overall power requirements. Um, and the other key point that I'll, I'll get to in some detail is the center of gravity uh, being dependent on the pilot movement. So you've all seen this many times, I believe Dan Newman put it up as well. Um, vertical and short takeoff and landing aircraft and propulsion concepts. Your requirements are different for the GoFly vehicle, but the um, the history of, of uh, VSTAL is an attempt to generate runway or, or large ship independent operations to be able to do uh, some military mission, whether it's cargo or weapons or some other uh, mission uh, in an area where either uh, it's desired to be widely dispersed or, um, or uh, 
small ships uh, being able to take off and land, etc. So every one of these uh, vehicles on here flew at some point. These are all flying prototypes uh, or a couple of production vehicles. Uh, and many of them used quite novel uh, approaches uh, for control, often like I showed in the Sikorsky VS300 picture, multiple uh, tail rotors and different axes rather than depending on say propellers tilting or, or jet thrusters. The, um, a, a good example is a lot of these aircraft either flew as airplanes where they took off up the runway or they hovered. But what was much more difficult for many of these and why a lot of them failed was the, uh, the lack of ability to go from one state to the other, either to take off and accelerate and convert or to decelerate and return to a hover and landing. So one question is compare your configurations, your phase two configurations to, um, to existing aircraft and where does it fall? And then how were these aircraft controls? In a, in a couple of cases, like the Harrier, they used, uh, uh, they used puff jets, uh, you know, using significant amounts of bleed air out of the engine. Others used multiple tail rotors. Others control uh, motion of the, of the, of the uh, whether it's a jet or a rock, um, not a rocket, but, uh, or, and, and others used uh, controllable uh, deflected flaps underneath um, underneath the rotors. So again, sort of falling, how these things fall into uh, categories, uh, starting with the more in the rotor uh, side where the rotor itself is also the controller in many cases, right? Sort of typical to the helicopter. Um, getting out to a point where you have very hand heavy and unwieldy jet engines that uh, may or may not be uh, able to be used for uh, direct uh, control. They may be more usable for thrust or for direct lift, but not for uh, fine roll control or pitch. So. So again, going back to the idea of the, the short coupling between uh, the control devices and the center of gravity, Imagine a quadcopter uh, that's, that's wide and you want to control it around the red axis. And you have uh, for each of your uh, propellers or, or uh, ducted fans, you have a maximum uh, lift, power, uh, shaft torque, a load, or uh, uh, a rotor RPM. And that constitutes what your control margin is. So if you want to roll around the red axis, uh, increase thrust on one side, decrease it on the other. So far, so good. Now you make your vehicle uh, much narrower to fit into the constraints of the, of the design uh, requirements for GoFly. And now, uh, you know, you're, you're, while the inertia may have gone down for this particular configuration, the, uh, the moment arm has gone down significantly. And now you're eating up much more of your control margin for a given rotor. And okay, that's one axis. And now we have the same control that we're using in both uh, uh, the red axis and the green axis. So we'll call them pitch and roll for lack of imagination. And uh, uh, the control uh, axis now to provide the exact same amount of control because the aircraft in this particular picture is uh, more or less symmetrical. I'm now potentially exceeding my uh, uh, my capabilities uh, for for the um, for any for an individual prop. So now, uh, question is uh, is is what do I do about that? I I need to think about these in terms of sizing uh, the configuration to be able to handle that that power and that requirement. So the key here, I guess, is is one G lift. Um, is, is a great place to start for a, a, a lifting vehicle, but for one that depends on its lift and its control from, the, from similar parts of the configuration, you can't stop there. And oh, by the way, we can add another axis uh, here. It's called the yaw axis. 
and now we're talking about differential torque, which is which is great until something hits a maximum uh, level, and I can't generate more thrust than that or put in more torque. So now I've limited the capability on one or more of my rotors at any given time. Looking for nonlinearities in the control is really important. And of course, trim means balancing out all those forces and moments on the aircraft. Of course, it needs to balance on a, on a, on a range of speeds and uh, uh, with any configuration changes that may occur um, across the, the range of, uh, of air speeds. A good example, just in a traditional helicopter, is uh, uh, the way the wake convex back from the main rotor onto the fuselage, uh, wherein it can shift the center of pressure, uh, in this case, further um, aft from, uh, from being under the rotor, uh, and also uh, potentially even uh, having to change the, the trim of the tail to align itself with the wake uh, in this configuration. And then at higher speeds, uh, you might encounter a buffeting of some sort with the wake of the wake, uh, rotor or fuselage uh, interacting with another rotor, in this case, a tail rotor. And similarly, that could occur when you have multiple rotors um, uh, arranged in a novel configuration. And in many cases, these uh, uh, interactions uh, uh, haven't been explored for the non-traditional configurations. And it's, it's important to uh, ensure that you still have enough margin to be able to deal with worst case. So looking across a range of potential impacts uh, as, as you uh, think about modeling and simulating these uh, vehicles is really important. So what's a good example of that? Um, when you have a, drag, a duct, I believe this chart may have come up uh, also previously in, in, uh, in previous master lecture. Um, in, in symmetric flow, in, in hover at a high thrust condition, you're drawing air in smoothly through a duct. The duct itself is uh, airfoil shaped and generates significant lift as well along with the, the direct lift of the fan. Uh, so effectively uh, call it doubling the, uh, the lift on, on, a, on the fan. Now to start to move that uh, duct uh, sideways into a crosswind, um, the, um, the upstream uh, part of the duct begins to lift uh, significantly more than the back end. Now the, uh, you know, think about the, the flow uh, streamlines around the back end of the lip, you know, where, where the flow, if it's coming on the inside versus some of it's going over the outside. The duct lift at the back end of the, of the circle is going down compared to the lift on the front. All that induces a, a significant uh, moment um, about, the, about the pitch axis. And you can think about that as having sort of an effective uh, a drag location, so take the pitching moment and the lift and translate it to the center of uh, the aerodynamic center effectively is significantly off the body uh, and may generate significant moments that need to be overcome uh, through a control device or trim device, whether that's other fans operating at different speeds. So all of a sudden now I'm talking about changing the, the relative lift of multiple uh, parts of the, of the vehicle. Also at higher speed, uh, unless the duct is tilting, uh, you might expect that uh, that that upstream lip on the duct is is eventually going to stall uh, as the angle of attack gets uh, much steeper for the incoming flow, uh, and or if the if the fan thrust is reduced because maybe you have a wing uh, providing lift in addition to the uh, to the fan. So be aware of uh, changes in trim forces and moments, and can you still compensate that and have margin for maneuver and, and recovery from an upset? So again, looking back at some of the designs, um, they appear that some of them have a, a method of converting um, from, say, low-speed flight to high-speed flight. And the, the point I wanted to make here is that uh, if you're gonna switch from a helicopter uh, type configuration with the center of gravity located more or less at the center of action of, uh, of one or more main rotors, uh, think about if it's wing-borne flight, where does that center of gravity have to be uh, relative to a wing? It's probably uh, not in the same location. 
And uh, you know, uh, using a, an example from a tilt rotor, the, the, the engines or transmissions in a tilt rotor uh, may, uh, may shift significantly, uh, sh significant portions of the, of the weight of the vehicle uh, to move to maintain a reasonable uh, aerodynamic center while, while avoiding, um, uh, while achieving good balance, uh, both in, at low speed and high speed. And oh, by the way, it has to be flyable at every point in its, in its flight envelope. In, in this case, a conversion cord or being uh, the way that a, uh, a tilt rotor is described. So that brings me to the point about center of gravity. Um, pilot could be a significant fraction of the weight of this vehicle uh, as it was for, uh, for the Wright brothers. Uh, with, uh, Orville uh, sitting there uh, uh, shifting his weight around. So a lot of the vehicles uh, that were shown had a, had a motorcycle style uh, seat apparently and an arrangement of the pilot uh, or operator uh, uh, sitting on the, on the vehicle that way. Uh, on a motorcycle, this, uh, you know, leaning into the turns uh, can, be, can be quite helpful. Um, as a way of uh, controlling the, the centripetal turning forces and versus the gravity forces. Uh, but at low speed uh, on a rotorcraft, uh, it can be quite risky because it's difficult to coordinate a turn aerodynamically at, at any kind of low speed. So the key thing here is to look for ways of which the pilot uh, can be restrained um, in ways that may or may not um, uh, pull on the control effector. Imagine that I was flying an aircraft and all of a sudden the aircraft pitched up due to a disturbance. Am I going to pull on the controls and make it worse um, by, um, uh, by what I'm holding on to uh, as a control effector? Uh, or do I have some other independent means of doing that? Uh, the the uh, the example of the bull rider there is uh, quite a disturbance and his center of gravity uh, is all over the map um, as the, uh, as the, as his vehicle, uh, the, uh, uh, the bull is trying to, trying to knock it off. So that's really significant, I think, because, uh, you know, again, the significant fraction of the weight and any kind of disturbance is going to cause motion of the, of the operator or the pilot and move their, um, center of gravity themselves and potentially the vehicle. Uh, and in particular, uh, concern about oscillatory motion. Uh, I can say that I was driving down a street one day and I said, I wonder with this, uh, uh, whether I can induce biodynamic feedback in my car. Sure enough, I could it's by doing a chirp into the steering wheel and I found myself moving in the opposite direction of the motion of the car. And, until I let go. Well, letting go and when you're off the ground uh, uh, may, be, uh, may be hard to retain your position in the, in the vehicle. So, so the other, uh, one of the options I believe is to be able to test with a payload that represents a pilot, uh, especially for, uh, you know, maybe for some initial testing or validation testing. Uh, but if you're using a, a, a kind of a, a, a dummy or a dummy payload, um, it still has to, uh, you're not out of the woods yet, it still has to uh, mimic the reactions or, or understand them and, and constrain the, 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 the motions of the pilot perhaps. Hope that's clear. The ground handling Handling is just as important as handling in the air. The transition between uh, being on the ground and being in the air um, uh, was hard to see again from the drawings of the, the Go Fly Phase 1 winners, but many of them had very narrow, the ones that I could see had some pretty narrow landing gear. Um, positive thing there is that it helps to constrain the aircraft by being wide. Um, but also uh, think about uh, now if, uh, if the aircraft is con strained uh, when it touches the ground. Um, if you're using some form of uh, uh, feedback of uh, aircraft uh, rate or attitude and you touch down and constrain an axis, now the aircraft uh, uh, may be fixed in a particular direction and not be able to um, 
uh, reduce the error. Um, so you may get some mismatches between your in-air control laws and your, and your on-ground control laws. Assuming you have control laws. All right. So how much control is enough? So um, in the heave axis, uh, we would probably point to a minimum thrust to weight ratio of at least 10%. So a 10% margin or vertical axis. Um, it's based on some experience, uh, experiments um, that were conducted as part of the development of the aerodynamic or aeronautical design standard uh, for handling qualities of military rotorcraft. Um, and even that is uh, it, that mount is is probably a little tight for uh, early in a design program where um, large disturbance or, or while, while you're building up in um, knowledge of the configuration, there's still a lot of unknowns, and um, those unknowns can lead to to large motions, and you want to be able to uh, constrain and control those motions. Um, that brings into the idea that we were talking about earlier of thrust um, generated by RPM control. Uh, RPM control may have, uh, due to natural frequencies, may have a limited uh, range uh, of, of operation. So uh, don't forget coming down may uh, uh, have a challenge in terms of uh, bands of frequency or RPM that need to be avoided uh, in, um, in generating the control, uh, whether it's up, upward force for lift, downward force for for lift as well, or to adjust trim, and for differential of some sort to generate uh, moments and to turn the thrust vector of the aircraft. And the uh, these control uh, arc change in RPM need to be fast enough to avoid, uh, or fast enough to, to generate the kind of control in the time frame that the, the pilot is comfortable with. So how much roll yaw and, and Pitch control, um, I have a chart uh, following up here uh, that gives a sense of perhaps how much uh, uh, some good targets for control, um, control uh, moments and um, rates that can be generated or should be generated are. Um, ADS-33 was originally uh, specified for attack helicopters, so uh, it can be pretty sporty, but it does give some uh, sense of uh, um, uh, how much, uh, uh, say, uh, degrees per second you might want to generate, um, and uh, time delays as well. So I would I would direct you to take a look at uh, ADS-33. So example here might be for if you were commanding the aircraft to generate a rate about, say, the roll axis, you would require an achievable angular rate in degrees of second uh, degrees per second uh, might be a target here of uh, in the roll axis plus or minus 21 degrees per second. I'm not saying that's the minimum controllability nor the most desirable, but it gives you a sense of where you should be calculating um, your control power and your ability to generate um, uh, achievable um, uh, moment to be able to generate a rate and um, uh, reject a disturbance due to a gust or a shifting pilot or some some other uh, some other issue or touching down on the ground, et cetera. So one other way to sort of picture these requirements is to say, well, how long have I got to do something about it? And my example here is I'm I'm flying along and I get a disturbance and I start to dive and the ground is down there, how long until I hit the ground? And the pilot takes some time or the control system may take some time to react and restore that. And then it takes me time to, to generate um, angular moment, change the, the uh, in the case of the airplane, change the size of the thrust vector and generate acceleration that isn't downward anymore. So 
that's the total time. And you can think about that as an operational requirement. How many degrees per second uh, of pitch do I have to generate? Or how much, uh, how many uh, vertical Gs or tens of G of acceleration do I need to generate to, to avoid uh, hitting the ground within a certain number of seconds, you know, uh, in a certain number of feet or at a certain speed that I'm flying. So if you're uh, flying along in the, in the endurance part of the, uh, the go fly challenge and you're, uh, Pick a number, you're flying at 40 or 50 knots, and um, you're displaced by a degree or two, how long until you, uh, uh, you impact the ground. And that may set some guidance on height, but also uh, uh, reaction time and, uh, and the ability to restore the vehicle to trim. And of course, achieving thrust to weight ratio is really hard as it is for all vehicles. Uh, fast actuators, having the extra power required to do it, perhaps even lead shaping to be able to generate large moments initially or large forces initially to reverse into the deceleration and then the fine control to get back on to, uh, uh, to, to, a, to a desired condition without moving up and down and scaring the pilot. Um, Number of ways to do that, whether it's through a hinge offset and uh, the ability to generate moment independent of thrust vector, uh, or whether it's RPM control, um, whether it's the, even the size of the wires to provide electric motor current to, or electric current to, to the rotor in, in the time that you need it. So in assessing handling qualities, I mentioned aer aeronautical design standard 33, ADS 33E uh, provides guidance on control. It splits it into two parts, both an analytical approach and a mission task element approach. And it's a way of breaking down uh, flight maneuvers that need to be evaluated and can be done precisely in a repeatable manner. And then using handling qualities ratings to assess those um, uh, as one of the tools and data to, to assess the, the handling qualities of the vehicle. Handling qualities ratings can't be given in a vacuum. They can only be given relative to a task. And in this case, uh, the common method used in industry is uh, mission task elements, but it's not the only method. So um, one way of doing that, uh, for example, in this particular picture, you see uh, the location of the hoverboards uh, that are mounted in, um, in the line and the vision of the pilot. Uh, while they were trying to conduct a lateral reposition uh, maneuver. And uh, you can see some uh, cues out here to help the pilot uh, maintain position over a spot. And I'll go into that in a little more detail here in a follow-on, but I just wanted to relate that to the picture of uh, these actual uh, flight tests. So the hoverboard that you saw in the picture uh, Back here is the uh, the green board in in the center, and uh, you can picture these things as being almost like a gun sight. The uh, uh, when the pilot starts off, um, the vision, the the view is uh, that you can't line. Uh, you want to bring these together in such a way that they give you indication about uh, the final position and how tightly the hover has to be maintained for the aircraft. So um, uh, the notion here of uh, desired and adequate tolerances in the motion and where those uh, tolerances come from. Uh, in the case of this aircraft to be able to, you know, in any cargo aircraft to be able to uh, move over a spot uh, where there is a, uh, uh, a piece of hardware or, or to be picked up uh, with a sling load and precisely precision, uh, precisely place the aircraft over the load to be able to be um, uh, hooked on by the, the ground crew, say, or to uh, drop a hook and somehow connect to the, to the sling load and then pick it up. So to, the, the, the mission task element in this case is move 20 feet to the right, align on the hoverboard, and maintain the desired position uh, for a certain number of seconds. And while also maintaining position over the ground, uh, as uh, outlined by these rays with, with traffic cones and whatnot to help the pilot align. And all this had to be accommodated, uh, uh, conducted within a certain number of seconds as being uh, 
judged uh, adequate to perform the mission. And where does all this come from? As I said, with the, uh, you know, you can think about your diving uh, aircraft, that might be a low level requirement. Your, your, your system of level objectives are uh, win the go-fly prize, right? So what are your mission requirements? They've been defined as uh, being able to take off uh, within a certain size area, fly for a certain amount of time, uh, et cetera, and then uh, return to, to landing. And of course there's implicit in that is uh, there's, there's the ability to control the aircraft uh, it has to be saved, it has to be uh, reject disturbances and gusts. And then you get down to the final, re you know, the, you can think about what, what are the, uh, uh, the lowest level requirements. They could be structural details, they could be control characteristics. And then the way of testing that is for each system, uh, building up some knowledge and verification, doing mission task elements of the aircraft eventually uh, sort of flying dress rehearsals and, and then finally competing that you know that you've been through all the pieces uh, that are gonna add up to give you the, help you meet the overall requirement. And as I mentioned, the handling qualities rating scale is a tool to do those mission task elements. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Bruce probably already uh, covered this a lot in his, uh, in, in his talk, but um, again, there's no, one, uh, uh, there's no rating for a particular aircraft. The Wright Flyer was not a level one aircraft per se. It could do one or two things um, well enough uh, based on the standards of uh, what they were trying to do at the time. And, um, and this is one a uh, rating scale that allows the pilot to to assess the handling qualities right what did the what task did the pilot do and the key here is what's uh, adequate and desired performance so adequate performance uh, for for the landing in the go fly is to stay within in the box um, that's been defined for for the landing zone um, uh, adequate performance is probably to land anywhere in the box. Desired performance is to land in the box and not touch the edges, right? So that's the that's the the goal that uh, you may be shooting for in there. Um, at higher speed flight, it may be uh, as I alluded to earlier, it's avoid the ground following uh, you know a, a pitch down of a certain percentage of the uh, uh, of the stick or, or, or recover back to the initial altitude uh, within uh, so many tenths of a second uh, before, uh, uh, before impact. Say. So to do that, I would advocate sort of a build-up approach. Um, use prediction, right? You have uh, designs and, and they're good starts and make sure that you have uh, substantiating data that supports those design choices. Could be physical or uh, like wind tunnel or, or test bench models uh, of propulsors. Could be analytical models, including uh, computational fluid dynamics. Could be uh, bench tests uh, where there's a step input to a controller and then a measurement of a force coming out of an individual uh, uh, propeller or device. Um, and then use that to uh, to build a simulation and prepare expected results for the vehicle as a whole. And uh, the importance of planning is these are novel configurations and uh, some of the lessons of the past are useful, but you're breaking new ground. So plan a test program with well-defined objectives uh, designed to help you complete your mission even when your mission is down at the very lowest level of that uh, V chart of requirements and testing. It may be helpful to have outside experts critique your approach and your predictions uh, in the interest of flight, flight safety. Um, the, um, as you begin to test, make sure you're measuring and recording data for later review. Um, very uh, difficult to get to the end of something and say, well, that didn't work right. And uh, then the question is, well, how do you know? And how do I compare that to my model? What happens if I predict, if I fix my model in some way or correlate it better? Have I understood the root cause of, uh, of, of the differences from my predictions? And then use and explain those understanding and go back and repeat, 
it's a it's a often an iterative process in the, the world of uh, of design. So um, just to give a framework for discussing uh, uh, some of uh, the uh, safety requirements um, is uh, you know just picture a, a, a control controller of a plant uh, that has plant dynamics. It may have uh, propeller and aerodynamic characteristics. It's got electric motors that have certain characteristics. It has batteries that discharge at a certain amount or, or a motor of some sort of fuel. That uh, gets information from a, from a flight control computer of some sort that takes in states from various uh, sensors, uh, gyros, airspeed sensors, attitudes, rates, etc. And you have a pilot who uh, desires uh, with his joystick here to, to point the aircraft in a certain direction and and achieve uh, good flying characteristics and, and go someplace with it. So uh, one of the requirements for GoFly talks about single point failures. And, uh, and so what if you have this system that I just drew, where are the single point failures? Well, in the system that I just drew, darn near everything. Um, every wire that uh, connecting any of the components, the battery that powers the computer or the, or the, uh, the operating system, uh, uh, the power supplies, the feedback sensors themselves. So if these sensors, if these feedbacks, if these controllers are required to keep the vehicle in flight, then they are, have the risk of being subject to a single point failure and need to be designed out according to the, to the rules with the goal of pr protecting um, uh, the health and safety of the pilot. So how could we cause uh, systems to fail? Uh, vibrate it, if I shake my cell phone hard enough or in the, you know, in the vibration environment of a vehicle that it wasn't designed for, that may be uh, significant. You could get dust into the components, surge in the voltage, uh, external interference or internal even from uh, battery packs, uh, exhaustion, loose con uh, battery exhaustion, loose uh, connections, et cetera, and, uh, to say nothing of coding errors and uh, bouncing off the ground, et cetera. So mitigating them, first of all, is just understanding what the failure modes are and where they live. Are they in connections? Are they wires? Um, redundancy may be a mitigation step, but you need to understand what that means. It, doesn't, um, you know, if you have two things, you, uh, you've potentially faced the Byzantine problem where they could both be lying to you, but it's hard to tell which one. Um, qualification testing and understanding the environment, in particular the vibration environment, um, and uh, some form of, of crashworthiness or, or, uh, or recovery uh, for the operator, uh, including from unusual attitudes. I mean, uh, you know, many aircraft that are subject to instrument uh, flying rules have to go to uh, uh, unusual attitudes and then have the pilot uh, deduce how to recover uh, uh, following that. So again, uh, just coming back to the, uh, uh, to the, to the 10 uh, uh, phase one winners, uh, a wide variety of configurations here and um, uh, really interesting set of challenges. Some really, really novel perhaps, but some look a lot like that V-stall wheel and there's definitely lessons to be learned from the past as, as, uh, as well as going uh, into the future. Uh, so I guess uh, Nidhi, uh, be glad to, uh, to entertain questions for, from the GoFly team. Great, thanks so much, Joe. Yeah. Um, a lot of information, so I'm sure people will take a few moments to absorb. Um, one of the questions that we have is the GoFly rules uh, limit the platform size uh, to 8.5 feet. So the moment arm of any control effector from the CG is severely limited. Does this suggest that small control effectors near the edges of the vehicle envelope just for control might be worth considering? As I discussed back on the V-stall wheel, the Harrier is a good example of, of something like that. Um, and uh, um, unfortunately, the pictures are probably too small for me to bring up here, but uh, um, the, uh, 
you know, using the full dimensions uh, of your of your box may be may be valuable. Um, in the in the case of the the Harrier and its uh, and its uh, prototype predecessors, uh, they used um, uh, flow uh, controlled by valves. Uh, the challenge there, uh, I believe, is just the length uh, from the valve to where the exhaust port was. Um, you know, especially in the early prototypes, because it takes a long time for air and pressure to build up across the tube to generate the puff jet that caused the, the moment. Um, so uh, similarly, I believe the um, CL-44 uh, was a tilt wing aircraft and it had a, a, a tail rotor pointing vertically at the back of the aircraft, which it was able to, uh, it has propellers at the front and a, and a tilting wing it had a fuselage with a tail and then it had a propeller on the back and I believe the Doak um, XB4 also had uh, uh, propellers in two dimensions um, in addition to its uh, uh, wingtip mounted uh, props and, and other control effectors built into that. So yeah, um, the, uh, that might be effective. Uh, it has to be part of the total power budget uh, of the aircraft, you, you have to go well beyond uh, perhaps the the uh, the one G lift um, capability uh, that you need uh, in flight. Um, for a disturbance, for example, a gust or a CG shift or something else, how do I discover what kind of response in terms of time or magnitude is acceptable? Um, well, a guide in uh, ADS-33 uh, does give some, some guidance in terms of um, time to, to respond. Um, maybe this would be a good opportunity for Bruce to, to hop in. Um, in terms of uh, time delays, um, there are some pretty good guidance in, in ADS-33 about time from the time that you generate a command at the at at the um, the pilot stick until you see the response at the controller. Imagine in you know in a in a world where that was many seconds. Um, you know, I move the stick one one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand, and I finally get some response. Well, in the meantime, my aircraft has has drifted away. So. Clearly, there's upper bounds, and the and ADS-33 does give some guidance down into the, you know, 100 millisecond range uh, in terms of response times. Okay. Hopefully that's helpful. <clears throat> the next question is, what do you think about shifting weight as a method of main way of control, like in the case of a coaxial rotorcraft with fixed pitch? Uh, as long as the weight can be shifted controllably and repeatably. Uh, there's a good example of, uh, of an aircraft, uh, you know, one of the uh, swing wing uh, bombers that reconfigured itself to fly fast with wings that swept back. Um, and, and, uh, and there's other examples of aircraft that uh, would fly supersonic and have a large shift in the, um, in the, um, uh, in the location of the um, of the aerodynamic center, and they had to pump fuel around the uh, the uh, around the aircraft in in order to maintain trim. And uh, there's any number of examples of that getting out of hand or, or failing to do it properly coordinated. So, if you are talking in terms of um, if it's fixed pitch and fixed, let's see, fixed pitch. Often you find that, um, you know, as you change the weight, you may in indeed generate the kind of moment that you'll, you'll need, but it's, um, you'll see that the aircraft will continue to roll, right? If you, if you displace the center of gravity. So where do you put the limit on that? Now, now you may find yourself, you're rolling in to cause a turn, but now you're leaning the other way once you've established uh, the side uh, the, the velocity that, that you want to maintain. So now 
you, you've got this motion where you're leaning one way, taking out the input by leaning back to get the, the center of gravity uh, back over the center of the vehicle. So you're maybe at a fixed uh, angle and then leaning the other way to try to take that out and arrest your, uh, your speed. You could get into a lot of very sluggish, slow motion relative to the vehicle there. Not saying it's the wrong way to do it. I'm just suggesting that those are the kind of things in terms of what's the, how much center of gravity shift can you have uh, uh, by moving, say, upper body, and how controllable it is. Is it, you know, once you go too far, I can't go any further, or else I'm out of the frame of the video. So that would be one of my limits, perhaps. Okay. And if we change configuration in flight, do we have to check every point between the two configurations, or is there a number of intermediate conditions we need to check? Hmm. Uh, if um, one of the reasons you have a good simulation model is to help you uh, understand um, all the places that you can't test, right? Testing every single combination of CG, altitude, temperature, uh, airspeed, et cetera, may be prohibitive or even impossible. So one way you could think about it is to have um, uh, only um, discrete, um, uh, let's just imagine there was a, uh, I'm thinking of a, you know, if you were to convert an aircraft from one configuration to another and you were only had certain um, specified angles that were, uh, that, that, that the aircraft could command itself to, that might be one way of cutting down the, the limitations. But um, the, the, the way to think about that is, is what, what would be a, a failure mode or a mission task element that you might design? A good example is I want to accelerate to from, say, hover to my maximum flying speed through, and maybe I have to convert something to do that. What happens if I stop halfway and I need to come back to a hover? Can I do it? Or do I need to go all the way because I'm committed in there to a uh, forward flight and then I can only then slow down and, and recover or reconvert back to, uh, back to a hover mode. So in terms of demonstrating, uh, you really need to at least demonstrate that to your, to your own self that you have trim capability, I would say, in between each of the, the, the configurations uh, or configuration pieces. Um, I hope that goes all the way to answering your question. I'm, I'm being a little vague because I'm not sure which configuration we're talking about or, uh, but, but if you can't do it in flight, you probably need to do it on paper or in, uh, with a simulation. Great. Um, so is it right to interpret that our flight manual or flight altitude restrictions is based on the control response times? Uh, I'm gonna, if that came from the, I think that was related to a previous question that was asked. Oh, um, well, I would say it's, it's a, it's to be, it could be used as a guide, right? If, um, if, uh, imagine you had, uh, an aircraft that again, you're sitting here in a hover and you got in a drift downward. Well, if it takes you, you know, if the distance that it's gonna, at the time it's gonna take you to get to the ground is two tenths of a second, then generating some upward acceleration or at least uh, neutralizing your acceleration in less than that time is, is necessary. But similarly, the impact is small. That may be intentional, right? You wanna land, but to set a higher altitude, uh, you know, as, as your uh, minimum altitude, yeah, I would say um, that would have the potential that if you, if you can't recover before you come to the ground, then you might either want to fly higher or slower. Hey, Joe, I was just going to chime in also on, on that, that the disturbance you might want to be most worried about might come from a failure. 
Right, so setting your envelope limits, re like recoverability, controllability following a failure. So particularly engine failures in near hover flight or any, you know, most of these vehicles have multiple rotor systems of some kind. But so even if one of them fails, what does it say to how fast you can recover? Helicopters typically have some pretty strict limits with respect to that. Right. And often factored into that is the pilot uh, ability to recognize um, that the aircraft isn't going in the direction they want it or that the engine has failed, for example, in a helicopter. Um, whether it's because the enunciation is slow, whether the pilot doesn't hear it, uh, et cetera. So. Um, is uh, three access control still required for passenger comfort? Just trying to clarify this question. As passenger comfort is better provided without pitching the aircraft fore and aft. Um, I, yeah, good point. I mean, if the pilot, um, uh, however acceleration is achieved, you know, you're still trimming out six forces in moments. So pitch roll and yaw moment, as well as accelerations fore and aft, side to side and vertically. So, um, if the if the decision of the um, of the design team is is that that uh, pitch motion is not desirable, um, then how are you going to tilt the the thrust vector or achieve uh, longitudinal acceleration? It doesn't have to be through pitch. Um, again, uh, I don't want to fall back too far onto uh, to helicopter experience. Um, certainly, the uh, you know the right flyer is a uh, is not pitching down like this to accelerate, right? So, uh, um, so, yeah. If that's a if that's a desire of the team, and you have a, a an independent way to achieve acceleration, and it it doesn't have to be through using the main thrusters, as I showed in that uh, sort of quadcoptery like an example. Uh, if there's an independent means of providing thrust that uh, uh, that has nothing to do with with pitch attitude you know, so be it. The, the concern is, okay, now I've got a disturbance, the aircraft through air mechanics or other, um, uh, you know, deflection of a flap or, or something or a failure has achieved a pitch attitude. Can I get it back to the, to the desired case or am I, am I neutrally stable and I'm stuck like this? And, and if so, can I then provide, you know, 1G lift uh, at that point? And it looks like our final question, Joe, is if you can suggest available telemetry equipment on the market for use in an unmanned version of the aircraft to obtain data for stability and control. Uh, in terms of hardware and, and equipment like that, no, I'm, a, I'm afraid I can't. I, I would uh, um, make a recommendation, however, that uh, in, in designing an antenna, uh, installation for your vehicle, make sure that, uh, you know, do some sort of uh, a test like uh, drive your vehicle around in a truck or something. Make sure that uh, you can still receive data from the bottom of the air. You know, if the antenna is on the bottom, as I get close to the ground, that uh, uh, the antenna may not propagate to the ground station. Similarly, on top, if I'm too high, I may not be able to see down, or if I'm far away, or if I'm behind a building when I'm doing my testing. So no, I don't have any specific recommendations as hardware, but I would certainly recommend uh, measuring all the, uh, the characteristics uh, that uh, of, you know, think about the typical degrees of freedom of the aircraft, pitch roll, yaw, airspeed, Vertical speed, if you have uh, some sort of, if you have sensors, especially if you have multiple sensors, are you able to, uh, uh, to read uh, the, the information and collect that onto a data recorder uh, all on the aircraft as well as tele tele telemetering it to the, uh, to the ground station? Uh, what about, uh, you know, power or current flow if it's an electric uh, vehicle? 
um, or there's some other, uh, if they're fixed or collective uh, pitch uh, props, uh, you know, are you measuring RPM? Do you have some sort of maybe independent sensor even uh, to, to measure that? And if you have video as well, and video is really helpful in terms of uh, seeing what the aircraft's doing and, and, and um, internalizing or imagining uh, what that experience would be like and, and helpful in, in uh, the user understanding of the vehicle. Okay, thank you so much, Joe, for that incredibly informative, chock full of information lecture. Um, we look forward to sharing it with the community widely. Um, so thanks very much, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you at our next master lecture. You're welcome. Thank you, Nidhi. Thanks, Bruce.